working their way back down the road to get the spoils off the side of the road, carry them up the hill, and then I get down here a little ways further. I've been just throwing them off to the side. My neighbor Doug's going to take them and push them down into the woods. He wants, right where his uh, tree stand is, in that apple tree, he wants to start pushing the dirt down that road. So I'm going to get it up out of the ditch here and then probably push it with my backhoe because it's like a freaking dozer. And then he's going to do the finish work with his little dozer. But uh, I want to put an hour or two in tonight and see if I can't get a little further along. Bob's coming up this weekend, and one of the things that we wanted to do is kind of go back a little bit to some of the vintage saws, and there was a subject matter that Bob was interested in, and that is those saws that have a horizontal cylinder layout versus a vertical one, meaning saws like this, where the cylinder is laid out in that horizontal fashion versus the vertical. Now the vertical stuff has been around for a long time. The horizontal layout came out in this, I guess the 50s, but more the 60s into the 70s and then kind of went away. Homolite, McCulloch, some of the steels, they had that, uh, that horizontal layout. Now I don't have as many of those saws as I once did. They've kind of moved along, but I've got a few. And I want to see if I can put together enough of these saws that run that I can actually perform work. Now, to those who follow the channel, this was my dad's saw. So obviously it has a place in my heart. It runs okay. I need to do a little more tweaking with it to get it just right. So I think I will. I'll put some time into it. I think it hasn't been running in about two years. And... Uh, Time to put that back into service for a day or two. And I've had this saw for what seems like a millennium. And it too has sat for a while. I think I ran it last year once in one of our videos, maybe the year before. But one of the things about these old Homolites is they just seem to work. You know, it was simple technology, but they had developed it and uh, it was a high quality product for the time. Part of the proof of that is the fact that this saw, 40 years later, after it was designed and built, still runs pretty well. It's, it's definitely passed the test of time. Um, conversely, the McCulloughs, I mean, there's a big following for McCulloughs. I'm not calling them trash. But they weren't quite as focused on the industrial quality, even though the, the pro saws, they made a lot of them. But the smaller fasteners and things like that, they just seem to be a little more finicky. But that does not deter the McCulloch fan base from wanting to, to collect and make them run. I've always been a fan of this series right here. And if I can get this to run and get it to run consistently, it's going to get some use. But my bet is the 925 is going to get the bulk of the use for me because the fact of the matter is, even though it's a big, heavy old metal saw, it's a very productive tool. And I don't lose as much running this saw in terms of production as you would think. It makes good power. Sounds different because it makes it at half the RPMs. Uses a more fuel, vibrates and all the things that they do. But man, does it cut wood. It still does all these years later and was a productive professional level tool when it was designed and built and manufactured and still is today. So let's see if we can get it to run and get it to run well. And each one I get going is going to sit in the truck because these are the tools I'm going to use for this weekend's get together. So I'll put these on the floor and start with the 925. Now there were two basic cylinders on these. There was a 77 cc and there was like an 81, 82 cc version. And I believe this is the larger although it doesn't really matter, they both ran pretty well. The interesting thing about the design of these old home lights is they made good power and they've got none of this good stuff that we talk about online all the time. You know, the quad port, the closed port, this, that, the other thing. These darn things were open port with just massive amounts of, of transfer area and decent compression 
but they were designed to run at a lower RPM. They have a reed valve, you know, some of the stuff that um, those familiar with motorcycles would be familiar with, but those familiar with chainsaws would say, what? And why is that interesting to me? Let me see if I've got a cylinder around for one of these so you can see what they look like. This is the Homolite. This is actually for that series saw. I don't know if this is a 902, 903, or is it a 925, but it's something in that class, right? And notice it has all that surface area for transfer area. But it doesn't have a, a squish band like we're familiar with. It's got sort of a dome shape up on top. Here's the exhaust. And if you notice, you don't see any intake, right? Well, why is that? Well, it's because the intake for these is actually on the crankcase. It has a reed valve set up. So the carburetor goes directly into the crankcase. The reed valve allows them to play games with the timing. You know, it's not going to blow back through the intake uh, because of the reed valve. And then, of course, like every other two-stroke, it gets blown up through the transfers to the top. And... Um, while it's an old design, it was a very effective design and obviously a very, very reliable design. So, let me see if I can make this thing run. By the way, just as a comparison, a modern saw, um, prior to the new Eco saws with x torques, that's all different. You'll notice it's a piston port design where the piston actually opens and closes the intake. Usually they're closed port, but there's also a lot of open port designs. And you see a lot more thin area, even though they're in the same displacement class. I mean, this is a 90, this is, I don't know, more like a 77. This is a 77cc version, I believe. But these make a lot more horsepower. So along with the additional horsepower, you have to have more cooling. These don't make quite as much. They don't turn quite as fast. So they're not quite as uh, dependent on the cooling for power as these are. This is a 390. But the difference is clear. By the way, that'd be a vertical setup. And this is not. This would be laid out kind of like this. It'd be horizontal. I'll let Bob get into the design discussion a little more. But I figured this would be interesting as a comparison to what you're used to seeing. Right? Of course, this is what they're all looking like now, right, as a comparison. Straddle ports and... By the way, these caps are pretty cool because it makes it easier to modify the transfers. One of the builds I like to do on these 562s is a pop-up. And... A couple reasons I like to do it. One is I don't like taking a lot of material off that flange and doing a pop-up versus actually machining the combustion chamber kind of kind of gives you the same kind of reduction in combustion chamber size without uh, taking a lot of material from here but one of the popular builds that the, the real professionals do is they actually go in there and cut that squish band to shrink the size of the combustion chamber and then take material off the flange right here to bring that to bring the cylinder down you have to take material off the skirt otherwise it interferes with the case on the 562s and the new ones as well and doing that build of course you have to adjust the roof or the top side of the transfers entering into the combustion chamber or well, the the more you machine the squish band the more you have to drop the cylinder right well the reason why you see a lot of these guys adjusting the top of the transfer, the roof of the transfer, is because of this. This is exaggerated, but look what happens here when you lower the cylinder. Is basically what's happening now is you're exposing the piston at, at bottom dead center. Right? When that thing is supposed to be open. If you've lowered your cylinder enough, what's happened is you have that square edge defined by the, the crown of the piston itself. 
So what do you do? You raise the roof of the transfer to mitigate the lost cross-sectional area. And one of the reasons why you get really low blowdown numbers on those builds is because you sometimes have to raise it quite a bit to recover that cross-sectional area. And I know that's a little counterintuitive to the guys who are strictly theory types because the larger blowdown numbers usually help high RPMs and the lower blowdown numbers usually help the torque. And with these little piston port engines after you've dropped those cylinders um, you see some very short blowdown numbers because they have to open up the cross-sectional area of, of the transfers in order to let it flow to the point where it can rev. So what happens is you're gaining more with the increased cross-sectional area of the transfers then you are losing because of the less than optimal timing numbers. Okay. Now another little tweak here is because of that square edge there's a turbulence and one of the modifications that's pretty common when a person modifies that roof is to get an angle is to angle that roof up say 30 degrees and a lot of that's to mitigate the damage of that square edge you know instead of having the Instead of having the roof go horizontal and go right into that where you have a, a definite square edge, having that roof at an angle relative to the piston makes it flow a little bit better. So the combination of the proper angle at the roof of the transfers and the additional cross-sectional area allows these things to get the, the RPMs after the uh, cylinders have been dropped. Just a little point. People argue about it, but think about it. Just think about what happens when, when the gas here mixture hits that at bottom dead center. And actually opening up the transfers to get cross-sectional area makes a huge difference on RPMs. And like I said before, what you're losing with less than optimal blowdown numbers here is more than making up because of the cross-sectional area increase. And then you have these cylinders with the caps, this makes that modification a lot easier. Instead of having to reach in there with a small angle grinder, you can just reach in from the side. See what I'm saying? So, but I always get nervous about reducing that thickness there. I mean, you drop 40 thousandths, you know, that's quite a difference. And the pop up concept that I do. You know, theoretically it's not as good, but it does make a difference. But you don't get quite as much of that interference with the piston. So I don't have to go quite as crazy with the with the roof of the transfers, you know, to get the cross section area back. And yeah, there's some there are other things that are not theoretically optimal with with the uh, pop up concept. But you're gonna tell me that's optimal there, you know by cutting the squish band and dropping the cylinder. Come on. All these builds are compromises, you know what I'm saying? So a lot of times what happens is the build which is most likely to happen by a person is the one that they actually can accomplish and replicate with the tools and the machining and the skills that they have. You know? It's a derivative if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you've got a, a machine shop set up to be able to do these cylinders and do single point, that's what you're going to sell. If you can do pop-up pistons and get roughly the same performance, that's what you're going to sell. Me? I'm not selling nothing. I'm just trying to let you guys get a little bit of insight as to the different ways that you can modify these saws. And uh, when you're talking to the fellows who do the modifications, and now you start understanding some of the compromises they have to make. You know, so food for thought. I don't know. I guess... I don't really care either way, I suppose. But I, I, I'm kind of getting out of that whole mindset because just a good running saw is not one uh, that's defined by being modified and ported. It's about how it operates and works with you as you uh, do your work, you know. A good running saw doesn't have to be ported. It can be a good running saw not ported. It can be a good running saw stock. I think the 562s fall into that category and the 572s as well. Let me see if this can go. I 
understand this thing has been sitting for a long time. So I don't expect it just to fire. In fact, one of the things that happens on these pretty frequently is the little needle valve in the carb gets stuck. And I have to go in there and pull the carb off and free that up, otherwise it won't run. So let me see whether or not this one's getting gas. Yeah, it might be. Typical home light. You know, it's going to leak all this bar oil out too. I'm sure it's pretty dry. Dumped it all over the shelf. So we have one running horizontal cylinder saw. And like I said, my guess is this is going to be the one that gets the bulk of the work. Just because it's a home light and it's what they do. Let's go on to the next. And that would be the Super XL. This is when I had to replace the fuel line on once before. I think that can be worked with. Because usually these can be a real pain in the ass. Sorry guys. And this one has just a little bit of gas in it. We can get a little more. I would really like to get this one going. something to work with here. Run a little bit fat on the bottom, right? Well, I have something. I'm not sure it's the best option. I don't, I've got these bars right here, but they've got the 50 thousandths gauge, and I don't have any chain for that. I've got uh, 58 gauge for these size bars, but I don't have any of the 50. But look at this. What a rugged sprocket that is.
These are probably made by, by Windsor. It was made in the USA. Product of the USA. I've got two of these bars and they're really rugged. So if I can get a chain from Bob, I'll probably put one of those on there. And then I've got this one right here, which is a McCulloch. And it's 58 gauge. And I've got a chain out of my box of misfit chains that'll fit on there. So I've got something I can use, right? This will work. I'll have to sharpen it up. And this has got the Husqvarna uh, 48 chain, which is really a... Uh, 73 LGX. So let me put this one on. And then I will have another complete saw. Then try to come up with a smaller bar chain combo for the little home light. For little XL. The newer saws with their inboard clutches with the sprockets to the outside are a lot easier to deal with. And then these big old things, you know, trying to get in there behind that and get it on the sprocket. some mirrors on so I can actually tune this thing. doesn't run quite as good as the homie does, but it runs. Uh, the low speed's a little bit off. Not sure if there's much I can do about it. It might just be old leaky seals everywhere where it's hard to get a stable tune. But I'll chase it around for a day, you know, let it run. And maybe after a day's worth of work, it'll settle in. So that's the second bigger saw that has a bar and chain on it. Oil's good. Now I kind of like to put a smaller bar and chain on this one. I just don't know what I have that's going to work. Problem. Look at that. Home light long before the rest of them had the internal clutch. The C series is like that as well. Where it's easy to operate, you know, and it's easy to maintain out in the field. Even though it's a really old design and goofy looking. That makes it so much easier. Right there. Boy, I wonder if that thing will work, if I can come up with a chain for it. Yeah, it does. See the oil hole right there? So I do have a solution for this one. I have to clean it up. So let me get the air gun out and clean this off a little bit. This was a chain out of my box of misfit chains. Let's see if it's long enough. 
Look at that. But again, notice how much easier it is to put that bar and chain on than the McCulloch, right? Maybe I better put the guide plate in there. How do you beat that for ease of, of working on the thing? Now, let's see if that'll run. I'd say it's good. So there we are. We've got three of these horizontal cylinder saws. And that was the easiest one to get going. So here are those same three saws after a day's worth of work. Bob and I put some time on them. And it kind of turned out a little bit different than I predicted. That might have been the easiest one to get started, but I didn't get a lot of time on it. This one got no time and it rewarded me by dumping all its oil out in the truck and now still leaking it on the ground. That was my thanks for putting time into that one. And this is a McCulloch that actually went to one of my subscribers first before I put my hands on it trying to get to idle right, run right. And he got it going. His name is Ricky and I'm not sure he wants his full name on there. But I want to thank him for that because he did the basics to get the spark and the fuel lines and stuff like that where it would actually run first. And then I carried it from that point on. And turned into a pretty cool saw. I think it's worth investing in. I'm going to get the right chain for it and uh, tune it some more. And we have another couple of McCulloch 700 series saws that are sort of joint projects that I think I'm going to fold into the channel. I like the way the McCulloughs look better than the Homolites. I think the Homolite was a better and more rugged design, although I'm going to get a lot of blowback on that. And uh, I like it. So thank you very much for those who have contributed to help that happen. And uh, the next video will be some time out in the woods with Bob. We ran him for, for a day, you know. I don't have as much video of that day as I would like because my main camera sits at the bottom of my pond. A funny story that only an old man could accomplish. Took a tumble and pushed the boat out from underneath the camera and I saw the core of my eye doing this big, lazy, McDonald-like arch out of the boat into the pond. It had an enhanced memory and enhanced battery for a longer, for a longer time for recording. And I don't have that stuff yet. It'll eventually happen. Anyway, talk to you later. Bye for now.